All right, good morning, everyone. So we will begin today talking about our proteins. We covered before um, talking about um, carbohydrates, fat, and protein. So today will be the end of our kind of coverage of a macronutrient system. Uh, we'll talk about the different kinds of proteins, what makes proteins different and special and, and significant, and what makes, uh, and, and they're apparently are different from carbohydrates and fat. And do we, should we eliminate pieces of people? Our intake of protein. How can we actually adjust our diet so that we can maybe take a little bit more protein and reduce our carbohydrate intake without getting any kind of crazy specific diet? And we'll also talk about different functions. Yeah. Okay, so the keto diet. Yeah, I'll, I'll get there. I'm better on it. I will. <laughs> so um, the, there, there will be. We'll talk about the different functions of protein and how much, how important they are. Sometimes we realize the importance of protein, but maybe not something we'll talk about here. There will be some points where we'll talk about proteins and their function and importance, but then they'll also be linked back to our micronutrients. So we'll touch upon them a little bit, but we'll definitely get to them in, um, in definition in depth when we get to uh, vitamins. And I'll, I'll tell you when, when we get to a certain point that we'll stop here with it and we'll move on to another topic so we get to micronutrients. It's just because things are attached together. That are connected in time. So, um, if we don't have any questions, we'll continue to talk about these uh, about proteins. What makes proteins so different in structure compared to carbohydrates and fat? They're made up of amino acids. So they have amino acids. Basically, they have nitrogen in them. So if you see here in the structure, there's a nitrogen. It, prior, can you guys see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So they have a nitrogen in there, and. And that amino acid group, that NH2 part here, is an amino group. And once it hits, in chemistry, we know that that, um, that ammonia, for example, is water soluble. So our blood is water, right? And for our proteins, once they're digested, they're going to travel in our bloodstream, right, to get to our cells that are in. So basically, they're going to be dissolved in or solubilized in water, right? Turning into ammonia, right? So it will be an NH3, the hydrogen from water turned to NH3. How many of you guys have ever smelled or sniffed or just came by ammonia? Does that smell so good? No, it is strong, isn't it? It is very strong where it feels like it literally burns your nose, right? It's that strong. It's dangerous. It's, it's, uh, it's poisonous if it were to be into our body. And it does through our protein, right? If you haven't smelled it before, like my little son would say, all I do is just talk about, you know, different things. He, He's five, so he thinks it's funny. It's like, mom only talks about, you know, number one and number two. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> apparently when you eat, you, it has to go somewhere, right? You either use it or you lose it. So yesterday he was laughing there off school and he was like, oh, mom, you had a class where you talked about number one and number two, right? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're doing it again. So there you go. <laughs> right? <laughs> Your son is going to be like, what is this class, mom? <laughs> You might need to close his ears. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's what it is. When it dissolves, our protein dissolves actually in our bloodstream, it turns into ammonia. So it's poison, right? If you feel our cells, just like when you smell it, you basically feel it burn your nose. So that's what it does to our cells. So how is protein good? And we need it basically for almost everything we have in our body and all of our bodily functions. Yet if it stays in our bloodstream, it's poisonous to us and can kill us. Right? There's got to be some kind of control as to use what we can use or use what we need and then get rid of the rest so that that ammonia is not sitting in my bloodstream. That's why our kidneys need to function or we make them function through dialysis. One way or another, we need to clean up our bloodstream from that ammonia. Either our kidneys are functioning properly, basically what I call the bodily toilet, where we're flushing out everything excess, including our protein, including our nitrogen. So it'll go out in the form of urea, right? Or urine. That's how we get rid of it. Um, but what was I going to say? But if it stays in our bloodstream, because our kidneys are not flushing properly, not flushing enough, or not flushing at all, then we get into the process of dialysis, right? Meaning, making kind of like an, uh, uh, a machine kidney. So we're cleaning out the bloodstream. Regardless, we have to get that urea out of the bloodstream daily, right? Because we don't want it to sit in there, right? So that's what makes protein so different and so specific and, and, and its function also is different even from other macronutrients. 
Now, although one gram of one gram of carbohydrate and one gram of protein both yield the same amount of calories, so they both give us power or energy in the form of four calories. But the way carbohydrates function is very, very different than the way a protein would function. And that's where the difference comes. So that's why I tell you, you can't only count on counting calories. You also have to count on the functions of which nutrient is doing what. Does that make sense? Right? So it's different. Even if we're looking at amount of calories, we're looking at four calories from carbohydrate per gram, and we're looking at four carb calories coming from protein per gram. The protein is different than a carbohydrate. Right? So when do I choose this? When do I choose that? Both are important. All right, so again, this is talking more about what essential and non-essential amino acids are. We'll get there in just a second. So there's about 22 amino acids known. There is some research that says 21. According to our book, it says 22 amino acids that are known, that we know of. However, when we talk about the function of our protein, we see that our proteins are everywhere in our body. They are in our DNA. They're in our hormones. Our hormones are protein, enzymes. Your hair, your eyes, your skin, your cells, everything you can think about in your body basically is made out of a protein, right? If not, in the very beginning, it's made out of the DNA. And it's that important, right? However, the, the AMDR, the recommendation for this macronutrient, is the very least. Carbohydrates is the highest, so this is 45 to 65%, whereas protein is the very least, right? But we still need it. Now, there's two kinds of amino acids. They're what we call the essential amino acids. So pro let me back up just a second. So our proteins, the protein that we have to talk about, are made out of um, units known as amino acids. So they're basically what amino acids are building blocks of a protein. Depending on how these proteins, which are these uh, amino acids, the, the <laughs> amino acids, so, um, depending on how these amino acids are put together, or their, their sequence, is how we get, I want to show you some here. Depending on how these amino acids, these are the 22 amino acids put in different in a different sequence, meaning in a different order, in different places. And so, depending on how they actually are sequenced, the order by which I put them in, it gives me a different enzyme, it gives me a different hormone, it gives me a different protein, right? And it does a different function. And so, if I were this is a this is an insulin, this is literally how insulin is sequenced to make a healthy insulin that will actually function properly. Imagine I don't have enough supply. So these 22 amino acids would be kind of like storage units, kind of like storage units, or I'll have a storage unit for alanine, for glycine, for uh, lysine, for isolysine. All these 22 amino acids, I'll have a storage for them, quote unquote, for my diet. So I don't want to use it from my 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 body. Uh, so what I have store, we don't have anywhere to store proteins, but for my muscle, for example, that would be wasted. So for my diet, to make these hormones. So say, for example, I don't consume a diet enough. Uh, that, that's rich enough in alanine, for example, the ALA, right? Imagine how many ALAs I have here in to make just insulin. That's one, that's two that I can see, right? So even with just these two, assuming that there's only two in there, just with only those two, imagine they're not there. Or I don't have enough to make them. It won't be a healthy insulin. It'll be an impaired insulin. One, it won't function like an insulin. Two, which is even more dangerous when I when we're talking about not only insulin, but we're we'll talking about other DNAs, we'll get an impaired DNA. It can lead to all different kinds of detrimental diseases, right? And th this can be caused either with not consuming uh, enough in our diet of certain amino acids, or you can be, however, through genetic dis disorders or um, the GI tract disorders, we're not able to absorb it properly, and so we're not able to use it, or we're not able to transport it. So you're actually digesting it, but you're not able to get it to the cell where it needs to be to be used. So it's digested and everything is there, but it's not able to enter the cell so we can actually use it. And these can all, like I said, can be genetic disorders, it can be somatic disorders, hormonal disorders, depending on what it is, on, on what, what, what the actual disease is or what the impairment is for that specific um, protein. Okay, so again, now we go back and we say that there's what we know of essential and non-essential amino acids. See that, there's essential and non-essential. In the dictionary, what does essential mean? Give me anything. There's a lot of words to it, but what is essential? Necessary? Bare minimum. What is it? Bare minimum. Bare minimum. Important. Significant. Needed. Right? That's, that's what an essential, anything essential would be. And it's true. However, when we did define, uh, if I were to do this, I'll say this is an important or a significant or bare minimum or 
uh, you know, very, very important amino acid, whereas the non-essential is not that important or not important at all. Can we say that? You just saw how insulin was sequenced, so we needed all of these, basically, or almost all of them, right? So how can be, how can be, how can one of our amino acids or a group of amino acids be important and the other not be important? So apparently we can't define it as being significant important, right? It can to some point. So essential amino acid is the amino acid that we're not able to make in our bodies or we can't make enough of it. And so we need to get it. It's important to get it. It's, a, it's significant to get it from an outside source. That's where the importance of significance and all that comes from, the word essential, right? So the, this, these groups of amino acids, the histidine, isoleucine, lysine, uh, methylene, phenylalanine, all this, these groups, we need to get them from an outside source, meaning we need to get it from our food. We need to make sure that we include in our diet foods that are high in these amino acids or rich in these amino acids. Because our bodies, because all these non-essential ones, it either has a good supply of it, it can make it on its own from the raw material, other raw material it has, right? Or it makes enough where it doesn't really need to be always refilled, kind of, right? However, these essential amino acids, either the body's not able to make it on its own, or it doesn't make enough to carry on our uh, our biochemical or bio reaction for our body to be grown, heal, thrive, whatever, right? So that's where the word essential comes from. So it's essential, it's important to get it from an outside source. That's an essential amino acid. Make sense? All right. When we get to complementary and, uh, and, and protein quality, it makes a lot more sense. All right, so just so I get to structure of, I mean, I don't have to go very, very in depth with structure of protein, but I really like to explain a protein. Can somebody give me a piece of paper if you don't want? I'll show you in a nutshell. People by chemistry are going to hate me because I'm going to show you how some well, oversimplify <laughs> protein structure for you in just a second. Just for this paper. What is it? Like, that's a yeah, so it would be I like 30 Here you go. Yeah, any kind of paper. I'm going to have trouble anyway. Thank you. <laughs> So this is what it is. So if you would imagine this would be, let's let's back up a little bit back to fat. Can you guys see me? All right. Let's go back to to fat. So say for example, we compare it to uh, a butter stick that is in the freezer or that's frozen, right? And you want to come in, you cut right through. It's kind of hard to get through because the inside is frozen, right? So what do we do? We keep it out a little bit, it starts to thaw. The more it thaws, it starts to thaw from the outside. So I'm able to cut a little bit. And then the more it starts to thaw, we can get more into the inside. For me to be able to digest it, I need to get all the way through, right? My life case, my knife that doesn't cut the, the fat needs to go all the way through. That's more talking about fat. That's where bio comes in, where it kind of crunches and breaks it to pieces so that now it's all spread out and we can actually work on it. Right? Same thing with protein. Protein is usually in the form of this kind of crumble. Some four different structures are all connected all together. For a protease, which is the knife that will actually break down a protein, if it works on it, it's going to work on the outside. But it's not going to get in the inside. Right? So we need to do something called denature, or our body actually does something called denaturing, which will change the nature of the protein, changing it from being into a four structure. And basically start to open it up until it becomes this sheet kind of structure where it's the, the, the simplest form of a protein. Now the proteins can come in, cut, and work and digest for whatever it wants. How does it move, or how does it change, or how does it denature from this structure to this? What do we have in our body that's specific for protein that can actually denature protein? Let me give you show you a slide and maybe from the slide you can kind of look at it and say, hmm, maybe this is what it is. This. What's happening here? Eat. Eat, right? What happened to this, the, to this egg? It got fried. Hmm? It got fried. It got fried, so we say fried egg, but what happened to the egg white and the egg yolk? <laughs> they separated, but what happened to the egg yolk? Is it egg white now? See where it was before, here? It was clear, and then it became 
Why did its structure change? Right? It became stiffer. So this is image, this is not, this is the actual nature of it. And then we change the nature of that protein. Does that make sense? So the stiffening of the egg white, for example, is denaturing or changing the nature of that protein. So it's now basically cooked. Now, do we have any kind of heat or what well, we understand we need to basically cook, quote unquote, cook our protein, right? So if you'd imagine it to be um, meat, for example, or steak, you really can't eat, you can't rely on it like you would on a carbohydrate, for example, that would dissolve in water if we're talking about sugar, for example. Or if we're talking about fat, just to simply just put it out for a few minutes, then it'll, you know, kind of thaw out. Really, if you're talking about steak or meat or something, you really won't cook itself. And you actually have to put it under boiling water, have to grill it, barbecue it. It has to be under extensive heat for a long period of time, right? But well, we don't have that heat in our body. What do we do? How do we need denature our proteins in our body? What do we have? What is it? Who said that? Yes, your stomach acid. Your stomach acid is what acts as quote unquote kind of your stove in your body, right? So that uh, hydrochloric acid, the acid that we have in our stomach, is there to denature our protein, basically to help digest our protein. It needs to be denatured first and then starts to break down into amino acids. Right? And so the acid in our stomach basically acts as our heat. We can't catch our bodies on fire, on fire all the time or have it. Remember, we're an incubator. It needs to be at a certain body temperature because we're a bunch of cells, right? So we can't increase that body heat. So the only way we can actually denature our protein without increasing our core body temperature is through our acid, hydrochloric acid that we have in our stomach. Right? Now, there's something very important about that acid in our stomach. It's only in our stomach, but that's one thing. Keep it in mind. Because I'm going to ask the question. We know that we have this, what I call the very beginning, we start talking about digestion. We're talking about the protein knife or the, the, the enzyme that will actually come in or a pathogen that will eat the proteins, right? And I told you just a little bit while ago, if you remember, I told you that basically most of our body, if not all of it, is made out of protein. Our skin, our hair, our eyes, our DNA, our hormones, our enzymes, everything in our body is made out of a protein. Now, if that protein will, were to be set loose, Right? It will, in what common sense and in theory would be, is that we're born and then we're deteriorated in one second. Right? Because we're born with our protein, we're born with our skin, we're food. maybe not even be born, maybe just deteriorate as we're in our mom's stomach and we're done. Right? What is it that controls this path man that's looking for protein? Because we know with lipase, whenever it finds the fat, it's going to digest the fat. We know with, with carbohydrates, or amylase, whenever it finds a carbohydrate, it will digest it, it will eat it up, catch it up. Same thing, should be the same thing and everything applies for a protein. Sure, it does. But how, what, what keeps it from basically eating up the rest of our body? And just digesting our dietary protein, protein that comes from our food only and not any other kind of protein. What makes it so specific? There's got to be some kind of control on it. Because this is dangerous if we were to be let loose in our body. This is dangerous. What is it? Isn't that just the hormones? Or like the foreman of the whole construction site that's going on? You mean the hormones in our body? Yeah. It'll eat it if it finds it. Oh. If, if, it's, if it's let loose and it's activated, yeah. It'll eat up all the hormones because hormones are proteins. Prior, what do you think? You guys have any idea if you can hear me? It's been hard to hear for me. So I, I hear about every other word sometimes. Hmm. Give me just a minute. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm assuming we're recording now, so. Uh, all right. So what is it? Tell me, what is the secret to activate or deactivate this protease, this Pac-Man that I don't want to be all over my body? There's got to be something that controls it. Nope. Enzymes are proteins. So that protease will look for the enzyme and eat it. Come on, guys. Think. What do we say specific for protein? We said we have acid in the stomach. It only eats up or digests dietary protein, so what's thrown actually in the stomach, 
but it doesn't eat anything else outside of our stomach. Is it what? Is it the Pac-Man the the Pac is not stuck in the stomach. If it were to be let loose, it's not stuck in the stomach. It's, it's detecting and signaling every single protein it finds. It's like, oh, this is where I go. This is how the Pac-Man works. So it detects whatever protein is there. So I remember when I talked to you guys about insulin, where it's actually secreted in the form of pre-pro-insulin. Let me go to my whiteboard. I'm going to use it again, the whiteboard. I am. <laughs> <laughs> just wish it's going to work fine. Not like last time. Okay. All right. So remember when I told you guys insulin is being released in the form of if this were to be insulin. So the active insulin, the one that will actually take in my carbohydrates, my protein, my fat into the cell. So we actually, we actually use it, right? It's covered in capsule. Basically, it's called a pre, it's not a capsule. It's, if you're talking about structure, it's going to be in the form of a tail, but still we'll talk, we'll say capsule. So pre pro insulin. So this is the pre I've been right with this. And that's the pro insulin. So basically it has two capsules on it. My goodness. Right? Before this activated insulin is actually released. Right? The reason is that insulin, as important as it is, we don't want it to be released freely so that it's taking everything in. If we were to do that, then all my glucose in my bloodstream will be sucked in or taken in or thrown into myself, leaving my blood glucose at zero. It can kill you, right? Same thing with all the other nutrients. We want to have some kind of control on it so that if it were to take in the glucose to a certain point, then glucagon starts to increase so that keeps it stable, right? Together. What tells us for insulin to, to be secreted and to work? And what tells it to stop? There's got to be some kind of a signal that says in the beginning, do you want me to dissolve this, this pro capsule? We say yes. And then it acts again. It's like, do you want me to really release this insulin? Because once it's activated or it's actually freed out, then it's going to start dumping everything into the cell, right? And so we say yes. And there's a free insulin there, right? Imagine the same scenario now with being with a protein, right? This is my protein or my Pac-Man, all right? I'll just draw it in the form of a Pac-Man if I can here. My crazy looking Pac-Man, right? That's the one that's gonna eat up all of my proteins, everything, everything you can find it. Find your hair, your eyes, your skin, your everything. Your DNA, your, your protein, your enzymes, your hormones, eat it all. But it's also covered in a capsule, the pre-pro protease, right? So, I'm sorry, my drawings are, I'm drawing with a mouse, so it's not that easy. So, They're covered in capsules only, because they don't want them. Yeah. Only open whenever it's needed. Only open when it's needed. Yes. So what opens it? What opens this so that this protease, this Pac-Man actually only eats what it needs to eat, which is my dietary protein that comes in my food. What would you think would actually dissolve these capsules? What about our acid? Our stomach acid? Mm -hmm. The HCL will actually dissolve this first layer and say, hey, do you really need it? And we say yes, and now my Pac-Man is free to digest only my dietary protein, right? Where else in my body do I have, do I have acid? Where else in our body do we have acid? Nowhere, nowhere, only in our stomach is the only place we have HCL and therefore, this protease will only be activated in my stomach. Who cares if it wanders around all over my body? It won't be. It's covered in that, those cascades, those, those, those capsules. It doesn't have an acid to dissolve or to take off those capsules, and so it's always going to be covered, even if it were to leak out or if something were to happen. Does that make sense? Like what happens in one two, two is the ACL just breaks the no, insulin has a whole different other signaling where it kind of takes off those tails for the capsules, but I'm just kind of giving you an idea how it's not released, how it's, uh, or it's not released freely. Okay. But the idea of the capsule is the same, the way it actually removes that capsule is very different. Uh, but with, with protease, it's through the acid is how it's actually removed. And so it's activated only in acid. Make sense? Isn't that cool? So both, so like both, <coughs> 
the book capsules? Yes, both of them are through HDL. And it sends a signal, are you sure? And then it's, are you sure? And it says yes, but each time it's taken off that capsule through that secretion of HCL. All right. Let's share our screen again. Is that clear how we can actually control, how our bodies are actually able to control the, the protease and digestion of protein so it's not eating up our whole body? It's really, really very cool. And I'm telling you all this in a nutshell. It's not really going into specifics how they're actually signaled, how we know or our, our stomach knows how to release or secrete acid and when to stop secreting acid. It's just so significant when you look in, it's so impressive. But this is just in a nutshell on how things actually work. All right, so we talked about digestion um, of protein before. Um, in our mouth, we don't really have a lot of digestion other than starting out with the mechanical digestion through our, through our teeth. So we're basically making things a little bit easier. Again, the more you chew, the more you make it easier for your acid to work on it, the, for protease to actually work on your protein. Um, if you don't chew it enough, say for example, especially if it's an animal-based protein, because we have animal-based and protein and, 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 and plant-based. The animal-based is more, to, so your, your meat, for example, is harder to actually digest, right? It's all protein. It all has amino acids the same, but um, the digestion of it will be harder. So if we don't chew it enough, and we throw it as is into our stomach, then you can only imagine all the stomach aches that you'll get and all the, you know, it has to do a, little, a lot more effort to be able to digest. Yes? Um, would it make digestion harder if you didn't have a gallbladder? The, the gallbladder is more specific to li lipids because it has the bile, and the bile is the one that helps in emulsifying our fat. So it will be more specific to, uh, to your, to, to fat as opposed to fat. To, to protein, it might have a little bit of an effect, just in general, and in, 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 what do you call it, digestion in general, but it's more specific to fat as opposed to protein. For our protein, it would be more of a problem if you have a problem with secreting HCL, too much HCL. Even within that acid that we have in our stomach, if you have um, uh, a problem with that uh, uh, esophageal sphincter, so that gate basically that, that's between the stomach and the, and the, and the and the esophagus, it has a little bit of an opening. If it doesn't close properly, if there's some kind of a leakage, then we start getting that acid reflux, uh, and, and it's not good over a period of time. It can be carcinogenic if it continues to be for a long period of time without being, um, you know, kind of deactivated. So we do know, or not deactivated, but you know, neutralized. Um, we know that when we, like again, that mechanical digestion goes through the esophagus, nothing happens in our stomach. We have our acid, where it basically kind of quote unquote denatures or cooks our, our protein. Um, and then when it leaves our stomach, obviously, again, say we covered in acid, which is our chyme, right? It gets to the pancreas or gets to the beginning of our small intestines. The pancreas will release what we call secretine, which is our, we call it the natural anti, um, antacid that we have in our body. So we'll neutralize it and then send it off to the small intestines will be broken down into amino acids. So it's building blocks. So with digestion, we're going from big to small the smallest it can get to is amino acids, right? So it'll basically bring it from the way it was all together, a clump of amino acids and break it down into those 22 or whatever, how many amino acids in that specific protein you consume. It'd be small enough to leave the small intestines, swims through our bloodstream, dissolved because our protein and our carbohydrates both are water soluble. So we see with people that, and then it enters the cell to be, to produce our, whatever it needs, our DNA to form enzymes, hormones, whatever it needs to be sent to. Well, to the liver first and then, Ourselves. So we see people that are on a high protein diet, for example, might become bloated. Same thing with people that are on a high carb diet, also become bloated. And the reason is that our carbohydrate and our protein alike like to hold on to water, right? <laughs> so the word bloated, yes, it's holding on to water, but it doesn't have it readily available for you. So you will be thirsty because your body is holding on to water, just like sodium would do. Right, it holds onto it, it restrains it. Not only is it restraining it um, so that it can help because, because fi uh, protein and, and carbohydrates are very similar to fibers. They, or carbohydrate is a fi fiber, is a carbohydrate. But again, it likes to hold on to water so it's not available to you. So you see, if you eat a, a high carbohydrate diet, you're always thirsty. Same thing with high protein diet, you're always thirsty because the water is being restrained and it's not being released to you. It's not that it's not always going to be restrained, but if it's a high protein or a high carbohydrate diet, right? But however, on the other side, if you do consume in your diet, hopefully it's a well-balanced diet where you have carb, fat, and protein in it. With that carb and protein, to be able to make use of it, we need to put it in water. So you need to be hydrated enough so that you can actually, that, that protein, those carbohydrates can actually dissolve in it and be able to be 
sent off to where they need to be and use it, right? So again, hydration goes hand in hand with protein and with carbohydrates. Does that make sense? Some of these we already touched upon, so I'm not going to go um, too much into detail with this. Like I said, proteins go into everything. You can see here with our DNA, whatever. But if we don't have enough amino acids or we don't have the right sequence of amino acids, two things are very important in forming protein. Amino acids, and if we have a supply of them or a good supply of them so we can or we have the right amount and number of amino acids. Also the sequence and so the, the order by which they're put in is very important because if there's a difference here, for example, this is a red blood cell. And this is a healthy, normal blood, red blood cell. And this is a sickle shaped uh, blood, red blood cell. So that for you, just looking at it, this is the healthy red blood cell. It should look in the form of a disc, to have this kind of disc uh, structure. Whereas this one doesn't look like this. So this one is the abnormal one and it's not normal. What do our red blood cells do? What's their function? They carry oxygen. And so through the hemoglobin. So um, if, so like I said, we you can imagine yourself as being one cell. You don't have to think about yourself being billions. Make it easier. If you're just one cell and you put a bag over your face or you suffocate yourself, you can only live for so long and then you just lose it, right? Same thing with our cells. The more they don't get oxygen, they will die out on you. And so we need to have a good supply of hemoglobin or uh, red blood cells. And at the same time, they need to be able to carry them. Not only do they, do I need to have the red blood cells, they need to be healthy red blood cells so they can carry the oxygen. Make sense? And so looking at the sequence of red blood cell, again, it's a protein, right? Or it has that protein of hemoglobin in it that actually carries, uh, the protein is hemoglobin. So it actually carries oxygen within the red blood cell. This is the sequence of a hemoglobin. Look, this is valine, histidine, leucine, all the way through, see these are the same. Let me do this. The top one, this is a normal hemoglobin. This is a sickle cell hemoglobin or a sick hemoglobin, right? Look at this, valine and valine are the same. Histidine, histidine, leucine, leucine, right? These are the same. Then where does this change come? That's glutamine, that's valine. What's the difference? It's not the same sequence, is it? Last one's the same, glutamine's the same. The difference comes here. Just from that, change, sorry, just from that change in amino acids, now we get a healthy, that makes the differentiation between a healthy hemoglobin and a, and a sick one that's not able to carry oxygen. That makes sense? It's that significant, it needs to be in that order. Now, if this was supposed to be a healthy hemoglobin, has all the amino acids that I need, but I switched this histidine to, or histamine to, um, to valine, just switch the order, one comes before the other, that's not a red blood cell, it's not a hemoglobin. It's not a healthy red blood cell because the hemoglobin is not, it's not, it's not a hemoglobin. It doesn't make up the protein, right? It's kind of like when you're mixing things together. My mother-in-law the other day gave me this recipe, had people coming over and the main ingredient was onions, obviously in it. I did everything inside. I forgot the onions. I cooked it and my kids were like, oh, it doesn't smell right. It didn't smell right. I was just like, we just not cooked yet. I was pushing it. It was gross. So I, <laughs> it was gross. It was not edible. And so I, I cooked it, you know, tried to broil it a little, give it some color, whatever, it did not have the onions in it. My kids know what it's supposed to taste because they taste it from their grandma before. They know what it's supposed to taste like. They know what the right thing is. So they're like, oh, this is not it. And they threw up and I threw it all away and they didn't like it. But the guests, I was like, I'm going to put this on my plate because I cooked it. I went through the, you know, effort of cooking it. I put it on the plate. They were eating it like crazy. They had no idea what it was supposed to taste like. I was like, this is good. Like, you go for it. There's no onions in it. <laughs> but it right? They finished it. They're good. But, but still, it was not the right recipe. It wasn't the way it should be. Does that make sense? Because I missed an ingredient. In that. Same thing with these. If you miss an ingredient or you mix up things, you put something before the other, it won't give you exactly what you want. And when we're talking about DNA. We're talking about protein. We're talking about red blood cells. We're talking, this needs to be perfect or, or it's not going to happen. Does that make sense? So some things that can actually, again, that can actually uh, affect it from getting the right sequence or not binding the same in, in the right, bonding in, in the right way or eliminating, uh, not being able to have, for example, valine. These can be different disorders. They can be, like I said, they can be genetic disorders. They can be uh, enzymatic. They can be, um, you know, uh, thing, uh, problems with the GI tract and we can't even absorb them or we can't transport them. Whatever differences can also affect, affect this, this formation. You know, they figure out ways to stop these sickle cells, but then, like, not that way because they don't feel like, like, um, there's like these cells, I forgot the cells they're called, but it's like, it's like empty cells that 
they just change the DNA for it to be your bone and it environs to make uh, regular the healthy blood cells, the sickle cell one. Hmm. Interesting. I think, I think oh there we go, stem cells. There we go. Oh okay with stem cells, okay. Yeah, so they put like stem cells into like the bone. Like, I remember watching mm -hmm. like a documentary on YouTube about person who's sick with it and this is why it was pretty much really like pro stem cell documentary. Yeah. yeah. But then you get to see how it works and how it cured the girl from like having the sickle cell to having like regular blood cells. Yeah, this whole stem cell science is impressive, very, very impressive. And you think there's something that actually exists within our own bodies, and then people are just now starting to, or some researchers are just now trying to figure out or figuring out how things can actually work and we can actually reset our own bodies through them. It's very, very impressive how it actually works. So um, I want to get into these building blocks. When we talk about enzymes and their function, or proteins and their function, one of them will be enzymes. This is one of the things I told you I'm not going to talk about now until we get to vitamins. Then I'll talk about this very, very specifically. We're getting to enzymes and coenzymes and how they actually function. Now, the reason why you're seeing slides from from protein and enzyme and, and sorry, protein and micronutrients is being put in together is that they only come together and they only function together. I told you in the very beginning of the semester that I will be talking about carbohydrates, but I will bring in proteins. I'll bring in you know vitamins and minerals. Just because our body works in a team, our macro and micronutrients work in a team. And if one of them lacks the other, then one of our staff members are not there and we won't be able to function the way we want to. Yes, we might have a plan B, C, or D, but then after a while, we'll just give up on it. So we need to have always those staff members there. That's what we, that's what we do through our dietary guidelines. That's what we do with our RDA, where you have to have your daily recommendations so that you're always full, your supply is always full and you're ready. Okay? Um, so, I bring this up because our proteins, for our, all of our macronutrients, once they're digested, they enter the cell, they need those vitamins and minerals to actually carry them. Basically, the minerals will carry them through those different organelles in the cell to actually produce our energy, to produce DNA, to produce uh, enzymes and hormones, right? Because they're thrown into the cell in the form of raw material. They're thrown in the cell form of amino acids. Amino acids won't do anything for you unless they're bonded in a certain way, put in a sequence in a certain way, and those are what the vitamins do. Uh, sorry, the minerals would do, or would actually help them carry out specific intermediate reactions where that they can actually form. It doesn't go straight from amino acid throw in the cell there, boom, it's a DNA. It's not how it works, right? So there's other things that need to be in there. So usually they come in together. And if we lack one of those workers, like I said, we'll have a problem with actually forming uh, proper DNA. Again, we've talked about them as, uh, or a little bit about edema, and I bring this here and I'll talk about it even more specifically when we talk about it in vitamins as well especially vitamin B. What is edema? Who knows what it is? It's this swelling. Picture. What is it? Swelling. Edema. Swelling. Yeah, swelling. Fluid. Fluid retention, right? So our the reason I bring it in here with protein, it's more specific to, uh, or it's as, as specific to vitamin B as it is, and I'll, show, I'll tell you which kind of vitamin B we get there, but to a specific vitamin B and protein together. With proteins, because our protein, there's specific proteins or type pro, proteins are supposed to um, prevent leakage through the vessels. So it's supposed to give the integrity for the vessels. And so it prevents the leakage from uh, fluids and salts uh, from the vessel. So it keeps it in the vessel, not under the skin, right? However, when we have uh, protein deficiency, the vessels are, don't have the right integrity to hold on to the water and hold on or the fluid and hold on to the salts. And so they start to leak under or out of the, the vessel, leading to that swelling, okay? So you see here, it's, it, it's swelled, basically. And that's not even pushing hard if it even looks like it, not pushing hard on the foot. And as you hear around the, the hands, the feet, right, the top of the feet, and that's where you see all that swelling. Uh, and then it starts to move on, obviously, to the legs and whatever. But so that's the idea of why we have protein here when we're talking about edema, even though it'll also be linked to thiamine when we get there, all right? And, and I'll tell you guys, this, this specific thing has something to do with my mother-in-law, so I'll start to put in my own stories here. Okay, um, talked about a lot of things. Okay, what is a nitrogen balance? Anybody ever hear about a zero nitrogen balance, negative nitrogen balance, positive nitrogen balance? No? Where do you think the nitrogen would come from? Yeah, so it's come from protein, but meat, protein doesn't necessarily have to come from an animal. 
yeah, it can be animal, it can be plant-based. Both of them do have amino acids. They both have proteins, whether it was animal-based or uh, or plant-based, right? Or both. So both, you are correct. It does come from protein because our protein, remember, is the only nutrient that we have nitrogen. In. So a zero nitrogen, basically it's talking about the amount of nitrogen that's coming in or the amount of proteins coming in as opposed to the amount of proteins, which are later digested nitrogen, coming, coming out. If the same amount or it's equal amount is coming in, is the same that I'm flushing out? then it's a zero nitrogen balance. That's in a normal scenario where we don't have uh, any kind of growth going on. We don't have any kind of um, uh, um, underlying problems, but in general, we're talking about growth. Uh, and then it's not negative where the amount that I'm bringing in, uh, amount that's coming in is less than amounts coming out. That's a whole different process. The normal pro scenario, not normal, but the, the standard scenario would be zero nitrogen balance. So the amount of nitrogen is coming in, you use what you need, the rest that's in your bloodstream should be flushed out and gone because you have nothing to use it for, right? However, in some scenarios, such as the positive nitrogen balance with growing infants, for example, growing children, adolescents, uh, pregnant women that are forming basically a whole different body, so they need all the protein to make that child, without those hormones, those enzymes, the muscles, everything that goes into that, um, we would see a positive nitrogen balance. So what we need is that the amount of protein is coming in, basically needs to kind of stay in so that we can actually use it, right? So you see in that scenario, it's called a positive nitrogen balance. Right? However, a negative nitrogen balance will be in the cases of starvation, for example. So you're not getting enough of that nitrogen in. So it'll be much less than what you're actually, what you're actually um, releasing. Why, if I'm not putting it in, why would it release it? That doesn't make sense, does it? it? Should be, if I'm not putting it in and nothing's being released, we should go back to the zero nitrogen balance. Well, doesn't your body kind of eat yourself? Or exactly. Your Exactly. So the word eat yourself was kind of going back to our Pac-Man, but yeah, it kind of will. So it's wasting. What it will do is that we have no, we don't have a storage pool for protein. We don't have anywhere to store protein. We can store our carbohydrates for a certain while, whether it's in our uh, muscle pockets is what I like to call them. So in our muscle, or we can pour, store them also for a period of time in our liver in the form of glycogen. So those are carbohydrates and we can store them. For fat, we know very well we can store fat very, very well. So I don't even need to go there, right? <laughs> but with protein, we have nowhere to store it. You either use it or you lose it. Or if it's too much and your kidney is not able to uh, compensate for the amounts coming in, it will transform it to fat and store it. So a lot of protein as well can also lead to weight gain and obesity. You're looking at me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, first time you hear that? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, because it is a misconception. A lot of people would say, hey, if I just go on a high protein diet, then I'm good and I won't gain any weight because I'm not putting any carbs, I'm not putting any fat. Coming from the idea of fat obviously turns into fat or it is already fat and then pro carbohydrates are our bad guys. We should not consume them at all, right? So I told you I'll get there. We should not consume them at all. And so now we're away from, from danger, right? And just go for all throughout protein. Now remember the AMDR, the recommendation of protein is even less than the amount of fat that we should have in our body. Because it takes time. One, one protein will keep you full for a long period of time, so you won't eat that much anyways. But if you do go for a full out protein diet, the way we actually get rid of the nitrogen, which is when we break down our proteins through our kidneys, right? Poor kidneys, they're just tiny, tiny kidneys. And they have these micro micro filters in them. They can only do so much for you to bombard them with all these proteins coming in. It needs to get rid of it. We can't be at a positive nitrogen balance if we're not growing or we don't have anything growing in us or we don't have, right? Make sense? It needs to be at a zero balance. But here you are bombarding it with it. One, it can only flush as much as it can. The rest will stay in your bloodstream. It needs to have a plan B. What does it do? It takes that protein, converts it to fat and throws it in our back storage. Because my back storage only takes fat. The storage units that I have don't know what carbohydrate is. Like, uh-uh, you don't have a pass, you can't come in. You need to be converted to fat first. Converts it to fat, stores it, right? Nothing can linger around for a long time because I have tomorrow and we're gonna bombard it more. And so until tomorrow comes, everything needs to be, you're extra, you're still here, go back. You're still here, you go back. But before until you go into your storage unit, you need to turn into fat and you need to turn into fat, you need to turn into fat. Carbohydrate, protein, or triglycerides themselves, that all or any kind of other fat needs to be converted to a triglyceride and then we throw it in the backstage, <laughs> right? That's the obesity, that's mostly visceral fat. We see a lot of high protein diets, for example, can also lead to the visceral fat <coughs> formation, which is the one that covers our organs and the inside. 
So with that, I'm not saying stay away from a protein diet. You can actually take off a little bit of your carbohydrate intake if it's higher than what you actually need, because remember, it yields the same amount of calories. So you'll get the same amount of energy. However, if you take out, for example, a little bit of your carb and put in a little bit of fat, uh, sorry, a little bit of protein, then one, you're, you're, you're not eating as much because it's going to hold on for a long time. Proteins take a long time to digest, and so you won't feel as hungry. Uh, but then also at the same time, we yield the same amount of calories. So energy wise, I'm good. I'm stable. Right. But then it doesn't affect my, my pain. It doesn't, I like to say it doesn't irritate the pancreas as much when you, when you irritate the pancreas, you know, like after it, like it's kind of like my kids when they're, they're sitting, nothing, they're fine. I'm like, just stay that way. I'm not even going to talk to you because you don't want them to, they're good. They're reading their, you know, don't know what they're doing, whatever it is. You don't want to touch them. <laughs> Believe me, there's times you don't want to touch them. But then here comes one of her, their sisters, and it's like poking them. And then, you know, first time it's gone, second poke, all right, third poke, it's going to be a high glycemic index. Yeah, I'm going to hear screams and yells and everything, right? That's what carbohydrates do. They irritate or they kind of make the pancreas a little bit mad where it starts to release a lot of insulin, especially when we're talking about high glycemic index, so your added sugars, for example. Right. And again, we start with an added sugar. We crash quickly. We get another added sugar crash. Right. And so with those added sugars, it'll actually make the pancreas irritated and make it mad. So it starts to pour out all this insulin. And when it pours out all this insulin, what does insulin do? Finds whatever it finds and pulls it in. Want it or not, it'll pull it in. Now you use what you need throughout the day. Extra converted to fat. Extra converted to fat. So the higher the insulin if it's not enough, if it's not compensating for the amount of food that I'm actually consuming or the macronutrients, if I have more insulin than I need, it will convert it to fat. It will convert all of your protein, all of your carbohydrates, all of your fat to fat. Right? However, protein doesn't irritate, quote unquote, the pancreas as much or the insulin. Right? It gives you the energy you need, which is very, very important. Right? But at the same time, it doesn't make that spike of insulin. It doesn't pour out insulin. It'll, 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 obviously it will release insulin so that it can actually pull in those amino acids in, but it won't irritate it like a high glycemic index would do. And so with, if you were to switch a little bit of the, especially, especially the added sugars in your diet with a protein, especially the, the plant-based proteins because they have less cholesterol in them and, 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 and things like that. So you switch that in, now you have the energy, but then you also won't irritate the insulin. Does that make sense? So you're most you're less likely to gain or gain more fat mass um, when you're using a protein diet. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Right. So the basic basically you don't want to you don't want to poke that insulin. Right. And so carbohydrates poke it a lot more. It makes it a lot scream a lot louder, whereas the other one would be hmm, just a little. Okay. Good. Yeah. All right. Um. What was I going to say for like this? So you guys tell me if I'll probably get rid of it. I just want to make sure we're going to touch on all these things. This is what I'm talking about: um, protein, animal-based versus uh, protein-based. Um, oh, sorry, pro, they're all proteins. Animal-based versus plant-based proteins. When and when not. Uh, when and when not to eat it. <laughs> I did not even finish my sentence. I'm like, I'm giving a good question here. I didn't even finish the question. <laughs> when or when not? <laughs> You're like, when or when not what? <laughs> I like how I'm teaching my four-year-old. Like, oh, what do you want to say? So when or when not to eat a animal-based diet or uh, or uh, animal protein or a plant protein or should we have some kind of a variety? Okay, so the animal-based proteins are usually very rich in amino acids. So they have the majority of the essential and non-essential amino acids. Just because they are eating the plants, putting them in their body, got the muscle, got whatever. So we're basically kind of recycling them in our bodies as well, coming from the animal base. From the plant base, it just absorbs what it can from, from the soil, whatever. So you'll find what we call the high-quality proteins. These are basically animal proteins, but they're also plant-based proteins, such as soy and things like that are very good in their amino acids. And then we have the complementary uh, proteins. This is what the complementary proteins are. For example, they say, if you're, especially if you're vegan or you're vegetarian, you need to watch out for this, right? Uh, if we were to put legumes, for example, on our plate, yes, it's a good source of protein, plant-based protein. It's high in lysine, isolysine, but it's poor in methionine and tryptophan. Very important amino acids, right? Remember, these are essential amino acids. 
the ones we need to get from our diet and our body cannot make enough of or can't make it at all. So we need to make sure we put it in. Whereas if we only eat legumes and base our protein, animal-based or plant-based protein off of legumes, then we won't we'll be lacking these. Now, what about if we base it only on whole grain? Whole grain is good. We're doing a good job, right? But now you're lacking your isoleucine and lysine. Whereas if you put in the variety on your plate and you put half a bit of whole grain in, this is not whole grain, by the way. If you put the whole grain and you put the legumes in your plate, now you have all of them together. See how they all added up? Right? So if you, especially if you're on a plant-based protein diet, then you want to make sure you get the variety in your diet. You don't have to go around and looking at your chart all the time. What do legumes have? They have this, this, they're lacking. You're just going to look kind of even weird looking at all the amino acids that are in this and not in that one and trying to make a list of what you need to mix. The easiest way is to, to put different colors because the colors are significant to the, the, what the ingredients that are in the, in the food itself. Uh, and then also have a variety of them. So mix and match all the time. And therefore you'll make sure that you have that, that, that supply there, right? Animal based, even though it's high in cholesterol. However, we also have plant-based cholesterol as well. So it's high in cholesterol, but it is your best shot maybe in, in, in terms of protein and getting the right amount of amino acids, just in that, in that um, structure. Does that make sense to you guys? Talked about weight gain, muscle building. We'll talk about nutrigenetics and uh, uh, um, when we meet next time. But still, do you guys have any questions at all? Right? Okay. If you don't have questions, you guys are good to go.